Good morning. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Colorado Conversations. I'm Vince Bizdeck, Executive Editor of the Denver Gazette, the Colorado Springs Gazette, and Colorado Politics. A short note about the Denver Gazette. We are focused on delivering objective and courageous local journalism, a crucial component of a free society and essential to a healthy democracy. We believe in accountability journalism that pursues the truth and empowers readers to make their own decisions. And we're committed to informing the residents of Metro Denver, Denver, our community, about the issues that affect their daily lives, reliably delivering news about people, places, issues, and events. And that's why we're here today. Our subject this morning could not be timelier, the state of the Denver mayor's race. As you know, we have 17 aspirants to succeed outgoing Mayor Michael Hancock. And let me mention that the Denver Gazette will host a full-fledged debate with all 17 candidates on March 22nd at the Anschutz Medical Center Auditorium. So how's the race going? Well, we have a great panel this morning. Let's hear what they have to say. Please welcome our moderators this morning, Luigi Del Porto, editor of Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette, and Ernest Lunning, senior reporter of Colorado Politics. Over to you, Luigi. Uh, thank you, Vince. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We have a great panel this morning. Uh, Alan Salazar brings decades of experience to the table. He serves as chief of staff uh, to Mayor Michael Hancock, Hancock. And prior to this role, Alan was the chief strategy officer for Governor John Hickenlooper. He also served as chief of staff to U.S. Representative Mark Udall and as deputy chief of staff to Governor Roy Rumer. Um, and, uh, Alan, thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Good to be here. Thank you. Also joining us is Kate Roberts, who is a principal at 76 Group. Uh, Kate has worked as a strategist and operations specialist for corporate and political clients, including presidential campaigns, super PACs, uh, the office of a U.S. senator, multiple Fortune, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, most recently, Kate managed the day-to-day -day operations of several successful ballot initiatives, uh, notably several amendment measures in the last few election cycles. Kate, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Luigi. Also joining us is Ian Silveri, who is the founder of the Bighorn Company, a consulting firm. Ian previously served as executive director of Progress Now Colorado, the state's largest progressive organization. He was also the chief of staff of the Colorado House Democrats. And prior to joining the state house, he was the executive director of the House Majority Project. Ian is also married to U.S. Representative Brittany Peterson, um, who is now in, uh, he, she's in D.C. right now, Ian, is that correct? That's right. Morning, Luigi. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Also joining us is Mike Hopp, who serves as president and CEO of Colorado Concern, an alliance of top business executives whose primary mission is to enhance the state's business climate. Uh, Mike served as a state senator and Senate minority leader from 2007 to 2011. He began his career as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, later, he was appointed by the Secretary of the Army to serve as a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for Colorado. Uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, finally, joining us as co moderator is Ernest Lunning, who is an award winning senior reporter for Colorado Politics. Uh, Ernest previously worked for the Colorado Statesman. Uh, he is the author of Trail Mix, a column that regularly appears on Colorado Politics, the Denver Gazette, and of course, the Colorado Springs Gazette. Ernest is one of those, the most insightful and astute observers, observers of politics in our state. Uh, Ernest, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Luigi. Look forward to it. All right, so uh, you know, uh, let me start with uh, with the obvious question, right? We have seventeen candidates for mayor, and I'm just astonished by that. How, how do we have seventeen candidates for mayor? Well, why do we have so many? Um, I guess we'll start with um, Alan, if you want to take that. <laughs> I guess the easy way to say, well, there's seventeen people running is because Michael Hancock's not running for re-election, but that would be uh, maybe a little more braggadocious than the mayor would want me to do. I think the reality is that with a campaign finance measure that Denver voters passed, I think that opened the door for funding for people who might not have thought about running for office. Um, if you look historically, people uh, uh, in Denver are politically active. And so while the number 17, 20 plus people might be surprising, I also think it's a reflection of the civic activism of Denver voters. And this is the first time an incumbent will not be on the ballot in uh, since 2011. And um, well, before that, actually, um, if you don't count uh, Guillermo um, Vidal as an incumbent when he was considering running. So it's, so it's, it's, there's a lot of pent up interest in where the direction of the city goes. So I'm not surprised that a lot of people are putting their names forward 
And it's pretty easy to get on the ballot, frankly, with uh, signatures, also with the public financing. That That's what I was going to say. 300 signatures to get on the ballot for mayor mm -hmm. also probably played a, a big role in it. But to mm -hmm. Alan's point, the Fair Elections Fund that matches uh, a lot of the money coming in and multiplies it by nine times um, doesn't just make it so that 17 people are listed on the ballot. It makes it so that 17 people can really enter the conversation. Uh, and that's kind of what's been interesting about this mayor's race is that there are 17 people running. And because the field is so wide, because the resources are available, and because right now the two polls that have been out there show anybody within single digits, nobody even cracked 10%, um, it's a wide open race still, and it's not that far away. Yeah, I really, I, I just going to add, it really highlights the populism of our times that we live in. Uh, I heard a lecture a few years ago um, by a scholar who said these, you know, populist moments in the country really aren't moments at all. They they may take 30 years to to sort of flush through, they readjust the politics, and then you, you know, maybe in the future we'll settle back to something that looks a little more uh, recognizable, you know, in terms of smaller number of candidates, perhaps not to the point that Alan and Ian just made, but uh, it it would have surprised me if there weren't, even even outside of these factors that these gentlemen have laid out, it would surprise me if there weren't a lot of candidates. There's a lot of turmoil, we all know that, and a lot of people want to bring different solutions and checks uh, into our system of government right now. Yeah, I would say, though, I think when you're a consumer in Denver trying to navigate and like, I think it's great. This is, you know, great Colorado politics is putting on this forum because, you know, the flip side of this is now voters are having to, you know, weed through so many different platforms, so many different people understand who are their names, what do they stand for? And that's really difficult mm -hmm. to do with even a handful of candidates. And I think increasingly difficult this cycle with 17. And what's cool is though, like many, almost all of them are getting some kind of airtime, right? Like CityCast Denver is interviewing all 17 of them. I think Channel 7 is trying to do the same thing. So it's not from lack of effort. It might be from lack of time to be able to like fully get ev everybody's voices in the conversation. But to your point, Kate, I, I do think that this is sort of one of the most inclusive mayoral races we've had. Um, just because of the factors we've talked about, but, you know, 17 people all talking and someone in the chat actually points out that there are 21 candidates, only 17 of them made the ballot. So there are a few folks running, I think, as write-ins, and that's a great point. Thanks for making that. It does seem like one of those ballots where more begets more, <laughs> begets more, because at some point, you know, you recognize that your, your path to victory in a lot of ways is made somewhat easier by just the the sheer number of votes that you have to get if you can if you can figure out a path uh to just uh you don't have to get to the top right you just got to figure out a path to get yourself into the runoff and then take it from there is that number number two is the sweet spot like that's what you're gunning for you're not even gunning for number one just gun for number two but um i want to remind our, our viewers and our listeners um don't hesitate to um send in your questions via, via the chat um uh, room or via the Q and A box, uh, and we'll try to get to as many uh, of them toward the end of the show. But I want to hand it over to Ernest because I know Ernest has some questions as well. Well, I do, but I, I wanted to follow up something something there too. And what Ian uh, just said: Does anyone think it's too easy to get on the ballot here? Uh, should there be some other ways of winnowing the field for voters so that so that we know who the serious candidates are? Uh, we were always going to have a lot of candidates this time for an open race um, and with the public financing. But is 300 signatures too low of a threshold? Oh, go ahead, Ian. Uh, it looks like you were going to say something. I'll follow you. No, my jaw is slack from the uh, reality. Go ahead, Mike. I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, Ernest, it's so nice to be on your side of the table for a change. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've been a candidate uh, and we've all worked and known lots of candidates. And uh, I believe to run for a state Senate district, which is an important seat, but not really, it's not, it's definitely not as influential as the, as the office that we're talking about today, all things considered. Uh, I think you needed, somebody's going to have to correct me, it's been a very long time, but I think you needed um, maybe 1,500 signatures uh, in a, and in a smaller um, district, you know, of a smaller group of people to go out and look for. So, you know, in my opinion, it seems 
it seems a little bit light. Yeah. I don't know. That's I kind of wrestle. I kind of wrestle with this because it does seem low. Therefore, we have 17 candidates. On the other hand, like that, then if you increase the threshold, right, that just privileges people with more money or more support on the front end. So like, it's a little bit of a tension. I think 300 is too low, but I'm not sure increasing it any significant number would prevent or would have like a have a helpful effect on the field. So while I agree that like 17 is a lot, I mean, the special election in Alaska to replace um, the outgoing congressman who passed away up there had 90 candidates on the ballot. I think we can agree that's too many, but I, I don't know if it's a good idea to increase the threshold to prevent other people from getting their voices in the conversation oh. because... So Ian, the ideal is some, some, somewhere between 17 and 90 people, right? That's the... Uh, I, I think that's probably a sweet spot, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what do you call this one? Um, er Ernest, go, go ahead, sir. Hmm. Well, said, yeah, we're two weeks away from voting starting. And uh, I mean, I got to say, I covered the last the last three mayoral elections, and this sure doesn't feel like two weeks away from voting starting. Right. Um, how are, in your assessment, how are voters evaluating the candidates? Uh, what's what what actual factors are they putting into this choice that's coming up here? And uh, what what do we think we're going to see in this first round? Uh, Mike said, you know, we you only need to get a certain threshold to make the ballot. I'm curious if anyone, all these uh, political pros here, kind of know what is that threshold? What what are folks aiming at? Fifteen percent of the vote, seventeen uh, percent. Hmm. What, what are we actually looking at? Two weeks out from ballot draw. Okay, uh, Caitlin, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I was actually trying to, you know run some scenarios in my head. I mean, when you think about what happened in the, uh, in, in the last race, you know, you had about 170, I think 180,000 um, people vote in the first round. Um, and when you start to look at some of the percentages, you know, you saw folks make the runoff in like the twenties and a couple of the other candidates last, uh, mayoral race, you know, got maybe, Two percent, three percent. If you look at that math, though, spread across seventeen people, I mean, I think there could be a scenario here where um, we either have kind of you know five or six rise to the top and start to garner certain percentages, and then it becomes very close who's actually going to make the runoff. Or the alternative scenario might be similar to what we saw actually in, we saw this in the um, Republican assembly process where one person just kind of garners a bunch and then it makes it possible for another one to two people to have a path because there was just kind of such a big vote getter. Um, I do, so I'm not sure the exact percentages, you know, last time you had to kind of break 20 um, to make it. But, you know, the, the math gets really interesting with this one because there have been, you know, five, six, even seven people starting to, you know, really, I think, break through it, it, from an earned media standpoint. Obviously, there's not very many people um, on TV right now. Um, but, you know, I think that there's probably one, one of those two paths, likely. I expect that when the candidates that have resources and funding to go on television do so. I would expect that's gonna be a much smaller club. And that's maybe when people will pay attention a little more because it's in their face more. Um, I love earned media. I think that earned media stays with me even as a person that's in public service, not running campaigns. But the reality is that people still focus their political choices, I think after getting media advertising through television that's that's evolved and changed a little bit social media has changed that a little bit but until we see who has money to do television commercials on a sustained basis i would expect that that's a small club of people and then voters will begin to winnow it i also think that the real race um, is the runoff in this case and so the choice will be whoever those two people are that'll be i think when the public begins to focus uh, more intently 
And to answer Ernest's question, I actually believe uh, three factors. One, the issues that are driving voters this year uh, will, will be part of the pot. Second, the personality and temperament that comes through. Uh, I think people ultimately want to have a mayor that has the right temperament and judgment, and they're going to try and assess that. And television advertising is only one aspect. And then I, I think the third bucket is the, you know, the unforeseen incident or event that galvanizes. Can't predict that that will happen, um, but we've seen mayor's races before where a snowstorm affected people's judgment at the last minute or um, I, I can only imagine if voters knew in 2019 that the city was going to go through the worst pandemic, global pandemic in, in modern memory, whether that would have uh, would have influenced them. But if it had happened earlier, I, I think it would have had also had an effect. So that's that's my assessment. And, and Mike, I want to a quick follow up on what Alan said. Um, you know, the fundamentals of a campaign, right? So, uh, uh, you know, a sound personality or something along those lines, right? Some base of support, um, some, uh, you know, ability to show people that, yeah, you can raise some money. Uh, so, you know, money obviously is a, is, is a big issue. And to a certain extent, that's how you send out your messages through TV advertising. Um, and yeah, some earned media too, but, you know, TV advertising. But, you know, if you look at this current, uh, crop of candidates, um, and hey, you don't you don't have to answer if you don't feel like it. But who would you consider to be in the top tier? Um, who who would you consider to be the top tier candidates at this point? And what are they doing, or what have they done to make them, you know, um, stay in the in that uh, in those spots? I tried to do what Kate did, and that is run a few scenarios. You know, if you if you just look at it from a math standpoint. First of all, it's not that interesting. It won't work out that well. And also, I'm not that good at math. So, <laughs> I, you know, what I did is I sort of concocted these these imaginary matchups, which to me seem somewhat valid. So look at Kelly Bruff. She's got a lot of money on hand. Um, she you know, there was a there was a recent public poll. She while there were a lot of people undecided, she was uh, toward the top of that. But uh, you know, mainly um, it looks like to me, she's got some capacity to go the distance. But then you look at a person that hasn't been talked a lot about, uh, at least in, in from the conversations I've uh, been involved in, uh, Lisa Calderon. She was on the ballot last time. She actually took a lot of votes uh, last time around. She's got some cash on hand. So what, you know, what happens if you have a Bruff Calderon matchup? I mean, it seems it seems possible to me or like uh, Mike Johnston and Leslie Herod matchup. They both have capacity. They're both very skilled at what they're doing. Uh, you know, Leslie Herod is probably one of the more skilled uh, uh, politicians, I think, on the ballot, I would say. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, talented people, but as far as being a, a politician goes, I think she's very skilled. She's got money. She knows how to maneuver. So Mike Johnston and, and Leslie Herod, I think that could, I think that could possibly be a matchup. Uh, I mean, you could see Debbie Ortega also. She's taken more votes than uh, many people. What if what if Chris Hansen breaks out? Uh, he's got some money. He just got a big endorsement with Mayor Romer. Uh, people have kind of thought Chris wasn't catching fire, but he's a smart guy. And what if he catches fire? What if he's on the ballot with Debbie Ortega? Uh, I mean, that those are kind of the names I look at. I'm, I guess I'm not really ordering them. Uh, I'd be a little bit uh, timid about doing that. Uh, I, I don't feel like I'm the pro at Denver politics, but those seem those seem viable to me based on uh, sort of those factors that they've got money, they've been around the block, people know them, they know how to they know how to mount campaign efforts. Um, Ian, a, a really quick question to you, sir. So we got what uh, a month of campaigning left, something like that. And um, so any one of those top tier candidates, or any one of the seventeen, what what they need to do. And how do they need to present their campaign from here on out to capture enough, you know, to be in that uh, first and second spots? Yeah, we've got two polls, one from the Ortega campaign, one from an independent group uh, that, that are out there in the world. Um, both show not a huge amount of support. Nobody's breaking out. Everybody's kind of in high to low single digits. So the game here is name ID, um, I think, right now. Uh, as things stand, if when when voters get their ballots and they open it up and they unfurl it and it's gigantic, 
they're going to look for a name they recognize. That's the first thing they're going to do. So whoever either has pre-existing name ID, which we know from this polling is not a ton of people and it's not that high, uh, but who can juice those numbers right when people are looking at their ballots, uh, I think that's going to make a difference. And you can be pretty sophisticated with your resources in order to raise that name ID, right? Like looking at the uh, map light on the Denver uh, Elections Division campaign finance website, which is a really useful tool. I encourage you all to check it out, denver.maplight.com. That's it. Um, you can see each candidate, how much they've raised, what they've taken in from the Fair Election Fund, as well as any reported independent expenditures that are going on. And you can kind of like click around and, and categorize it. So if we're just going on the money race, like Kelly Bruff has a total of $1.3 million, either she has raised and spent, gotten from the FEF, or is being spent on her behalf. If you click off the independent expenditures, that total goes down to 984. So she's getting a pretty hefty about $400,000 support from outside world right now. There are plenty of time for those independent groups to pop up for any one of these candidates and start spending a ton of money. So that's a big X factor we don't know about yet. Um, and the reporting, I think there's one tonight and I think there's another one uh, coming up soon here. So we'll know a little bit more about this later on. But there's a couple of things, right? Like you can go on TV, like Mike said, and that's a that's a really reliable tactic. Like people think, oh, television, oh, it's so outdated. Who watches TV anymore? People who vote watch TV. People who vote watch broadcast news on the four channels in the metro. I can tell you this from experience. It is worth your time. People check their mailboxes, right? So whoever has good looking mail that breaks out will have an edge. And since the ballot is so long, here's some free campaign advice, y'all. Buy Google AdWords. Buy them from your opponents, buy them for yourself, buy every misspelling you can possibly think of, because people are going to get this ballot, not know anybody on it, and then Google everyone. And if you're buying those ads and you're at the top and you can do some like the truth about my opponent kind of stuff and or bumping yourself up, that is an inexpensive way to start getting in front of people right when they're trying to make their choices. And um, before I shift to Ernest, I want to ask uh, Caitlin a really quick question. Uh, we have a Republican in the race. He's the only Republican uh, in the race. Uh, as far as I, and, hey, correct me if I'm wrong. I just got here like a year ago. We haven't had a Republican in the mayor seat for decades, I think as far as 60 years ago, something like that. Um, so, uh, Caitlin, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on Andy Rojo and how he's presenting his campaign, how he's campaigning right now? What are the chances of a Republican making it to, you know, the runoff? Yeah, I think, I mean, the unfortunate reality for, you know, those who are right of center in Denver is that of the, you know, approximately half a million registered voters, only 51,000, so 10% of them are Republicans. So in order to ever make the math worth work in Denver, you have to appeal to a broader audience than just a Republican audience. There just simply aren't enough Republicans in the city to actually ever break through. Um, I think that, you know, Andy's done a pretty good job positioning self, but I, unfortunately for someone like him, I worry that the issues will never matter because of the um, R next to his name in, in a city like Denver. And so um, I haven't quite seen um, him, you know, position himself in a way that is a little bit more broadly appealing um, to un especially unaffiliated voters in Denver. And it's just, you know, it's a big handicap uh, for for candidates um, in this race when, you know, they've got an R next to their name. Denver's increasingly becoming a progressive, more and more progressive city. And I think the real question probably in front of voters right now is what kind of progressivism does, what kind of progressive city does Denver want to be? Um, you know, is it, does it want to be kind of more like the West Coast cities, like, you know, Seattle, San Francisco, you know, I'm not really sure um, because those are not really my political leanings. I think I know what kind of city I'd want to be, but I think that you see in some of the issues that the candidates are raising, you know, that's, that's what um, I think that's the, the real big question in front of voters right now. Can I just piggyback on something Kate said real quick? Cause like, I don't, I don't disagree that Republicans are going to have a tough time getting elected in Denver. I think that's right on. But correct me if I'm wrong, this is a nonpartisan race. So party affiliations aren't going to appear next to the candidate's name. So yeah, there is no literal actually, R. That's a good point. Not, it's not, you're right. It's not a literal R. Right. Um, but yeah. 
like I, but I, I agree at your central point, which is like, all, if he makes it to the runoff, he will be against a Democrat ostensibly, right, in all extreme likelihood, and then they will go, that guy's a Republican, and then that will probably stop him from going any further. So the other thing is that Denver voters are smart and sophisticated and educated. Colorado voters in general are, but especially here, and they're going to know even if there's not an R next to his name <laughs> on the ballot, they're going to look him up and figure it out pretty fast. And I think, unfortunately for for the red team, that's pretty disqualifying in the city at the moment. Yeah, I think the last Republican candidate who came close to being mayor was Don Bain when he challenged Federico Pena back in the late 80s, 90s. I can't remember. I, I, I remember walking doors in that campaign. Um, and the irony, of course, is Mayor Pena uh, left office um, having made some significant changes and his popularity was not great. In retrospect, now we look back at Federico as the guy who broke through with Imagine a Great City. And um, so his legacy, I think, has has gotten much stronger as people get away from that, you know, initial blast. But Don Don Bain came agonizingly close to being a Republican mayor of Denver. But those times have changed, and I agree with everything that uh, that's been said about the fact that if if you have an R, if you don't have an R after your name, voters will soon learn about it, and it will be a dis not not disqualifying, but I think a, a drag in a runoff. <laughs> Before I hand it over to Ernest, um, I do want to note that, and I learned this one fairly recently, um, Denver has a, a strong mayor structure, and that means that the mayor is not just one of the council. You know, in other cities where I'm from, Phoenix, for example, uh, Glendale in Arizona, you know, the mayor is just one of the council members. And so the mayor can schedule whatever, and there's some administrative um, duties and what have you that makes that person the mayor. But in so far as driving policy and, you know, changing things or pushing for or advocating for a certain approach to uh, governing, you know, the mayor in many other places, big cities are just one of the council members, not here in, in Denver. But Ernest, go ahead, sir. I was going to say that uh, people typically say that the Denver mayor is the most powerful position in Colorado politics. Uh, it, it was a step down for. Mayor Hickamooper to, to walk across Civic Center to become governor, where he had to answer to 100 legislators, uh, and uh, as opposed to ruling the roost across the across the park there. Uh, but that that leaves a question is how how much can a mayor actually actually do? And I'd like to ask Alan here, uh, you know, we, we've got a mayor uh, there. There's some unfinished business being left. Uh, you know, I think I think it it makes sense that a mayor nearing the end of 12 terms and unable to run for re-election doesn't have the political capital that he might have had, uh, you know, 10 years ago uh, or after his first re-elect. What, what does the next mayor need to take, take charge of and, and do that isn't being done now? I think everyone agrees on there's a certain set of problems, a certain set of things that mayors need to do. What does this next mayor need to do? It's a great question, Ernest. I think I I think there's always unfinished business with a city. Cities are messy, complicated organisms of people. So there there's no um, no mayor has ever left office with all business finished. I think uh, what's true is there are some problems that are, are still plaguing the city and in some ways have gotten worse, particularly post COVID. And the items that I think uh, just just to draw this out a little bit. In 2019, the motivating issues in that mayor's race were really gentrification or displacement to growth. Growth was the big buzzword. Development, traffic. It was like we were the victims of success and, and voters were frustrated by the by the complications of growth and economic success. We had homelessness as, a, as a, a, an issue as well, and that continues to be a challenge. Today, I think the set of issues really public safety. Uh, we need more cops. We need more Mike cops too, probably, but that's going to get me into <laughs> trouble, Mike. Uh, so, so we need more more police. We need effective law enforcement. The opioid epidemic uh, coming out of COVID was something we we uh, we we didn't expect it to be as bad as it has been on our streets. Uh, the challenge of homelessness, which is not just about affordable housing and housing access, but also the set of issues that you see. Uh, with people living on the street, um, behavioral health challenges, again, opioids, fentanyl, meth have really taken a toll and it feeds into a public safety challenge that the city has. Uh, I believe the next mayor 
uh, will have to probably continue many of the programs and initiatives that this mayor has put in place. Um, there's a tendency, and I think it's clear if you're running for office, you can't run saying you're going to do the same thing that the incumbent is doing. But the reality is, as we've looked at the issue of homelessness, for example, I'll pick that one out. Um, there's no experiment on, on challenge of homelessness encampments that the city of Denver isn't already doing or leading. Um, and so I think the next mayor may say they're going to do something different, but they're probably going to use the same set of tools that we have, continue resources. And in my opinion, the fundamental, fundamental problem for the city right now is how to do effective intervention with people who are on the street, uh, sick and in need of treatment and services, and what to do when people either won't accept those services or don't trust that the services are there. This is a problem that we're not going to resolve in the next three months, um, but it is a problem the next mayor will pick up and probably end up using many of the same tools and initiatives that are in place now, but expanding them. Alan, just a quick follow-up question for you. You're making this distinction between uh, Denver and, uh, broadly speaking, Colorado's housing uh, needs. Mm -hmm. um, and that would that would be, you know, the, the need to build more houses, um, the need to build more affordable housing, the need to kind of make sure that uh, they're accessible. Um, and you're making that distinction on the on the one hand, and then the, the homelessness issue, which we were dealing with a population that may have other contributing factors uh, that have landed in on, on the streets. Is that correct? Well, I think the label of homelessness is how the public probably views not only the lack of affordable housing, the challenges around um, getting into housing for economic reasons versus the challenge of people who end up um, for various traumas uh, as a result of traumas uh, with behavioral health challenges, mental health challenges, addictions. Again, the, the, the problem of fentanyl and meth in cities across the country has skyrocketed. And particularly here in the Western part of the country, uh, since, uh, you know, like 2019. That's uh, housing and, and and shelter are a part of the, the, the solution, but they're not the, the, not the whole um, solution. I think, again, increasingly the issue is how do you intervene with people on the street who are in crisis? How do you do that effectively with accountability, with, a, with, with, uh, with, with uh, treatment options and with, a, with, with uh, actual, you know, getting people to, accept treatment when they don't want to accept treatment. These are very big challenges and they're really beyond any city's capacity. You need uh, the resources of the state, you need the resources of the region. And frankly, many of these issues, uh, affordable housing, homelessness, fentanyl, addictions, mental health are, are plaguing the country. If you go to any, any big city in this country right now, you're gonna find very similar issues. Uh, Mike, a, a question for you. What are you hearing from your members, and and specifically honing in on this issue of homelessness, you know, encampments? You know, what what are you hearing from your members? And the second question I have for you is, um, what would you like to hear from the mayoral candidates? And I think we're starting to hear from them what they want to do in this issue. But, um, what, you personally, uh, a, 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 and you representing, you know, uh, 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 the business community, what would you like to hear from the candidates? It's that, that's a really interesting question. So we represent uh, about 145 chief executives. Most of them are in the city of Denver. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to them. What are you looking at? What's important to you in the city of Denver? It is. It's interesting because as we get to the mayoral race, uh, you know, traditionally, I think you might hear comments more about slow permitting times. You have you have some of that, um, or uh, which Alan is going to fix. Um, uh, you know, you have all the all the normal problems that you have, you know, really with any bureaucracy as it relates to business issues, tax structures, things of that <laughs> nature. Um, I'll tell you, I, literally, I think with with I, I'm pretty sure without exception, uh, these 145, 50 CEOs I've spoken with, it's it's homelessness, uh, it's crime and safety. They want their they want their their employees, they want their customers not only to, to be safe on paper, but to feel safe, to really feel safe. They want cleanliness. Uh, I'll say that I think I think the way our CEOs are looking at the city of Denver right now is, is frankly, is the reputational center of the state, truly. And uh, it is kind of the expression of what people think of Colorado in many, many ways. And 
Uh, I think there's a lot of urgency around this issue. And so you think about what they're not thinking about, which is business. They're thinking about uh, homeless camps and and kind of the, you know, the the very desperate situation that people find themselves in. So, you know, we've dug into this quite a bit, Luigi, and it's it's interesting to me getting to the second part of your question about what you want the mayoral candidates to think about. I think there's a general recognition, uh, at least in our group, uh, that there are different kinds of homelessness and we call it homelessness. Uh, we call it camping, whatever. And it's kind of a disservice to actually creating real public policy solutions. You can't you can't fix homelessness. You have to identify homelessness as a symptom. You know, you've got to identify sort of the things that leads people into this. And I think I think, you know, for our view, there's there's a component of it that seems to be clearly uh, connected to drug use uh, and and an addiction, and there's a mental health nexus, no doubt about it. Um, you have people that are sort of the down on your luck people. Uh, our view is we've got pretty good services already in place for people that are maybe a little more tran transitional. Uh, and then, and maybe there's a small segment of people that are are doing this by choice. So, you know, I guess music to our ears would be for mayoral candidates to start talking about um, these specific kinds of homelessness and what are the discrete uh, public policy solutions that they can lock arms with the council to fix. And, and we think it's in, incredibly important for the mayor and the council to, to really create kind of a new governing uh, consensus uh, around this issue. It's just it's so vexing. And we all know that it's, it is happening in all the cities. Um, but we, we can, uh, our view is that we can, we can do it well, and we can do it humanely. It's, it certainly won't be easy. Let me let me tag tag on that one because I think this is really at the core of where at least my six years with the mayor this has been kind of the front and center challenge for us, um, and not many people know this but uh, thirteen thousand people have been taken off the street and into housing in the twelve years that Mayor Hancock has been in office, so so we know that there are ways to get people into housing and in transitional shelter to housing and economic programs that help them. We've done it. But the visibility of people on the street has increased. And um, even despite 13,000 people, which is a pretty remarkable number, it's about 1,000 people a year, if you think about it, more than 1,000 people, we still have this issue. It's not... Um, um, centric to Denver. It is a national challenge. It is a state challenge. And some of it has to do with poverty. Some of it has to do with uh, familial dislocation, families that, that that don't take care of folks that are in their family because they are just, you know, either fed up because of its drug addictions or whatever it is, whatever trauma puts somebody on the street. And, you know, I could be one trauma away from ending there myself. So you have to know that there are individual problems here. And I, I worry sometimes when we say homeless, we we treating people as numbers and not individuals with a challenge on the street. You almost have to know uh, at a very individual basis what's going on in that person's life. How can we help them? And if they won't accept help, what are the what are the forces uh, uh, that can come to be, come to bear legally to to kind of coerce them into help? And this is a tough conversation, but it's not new to us. And that's why I say whoever comes after. We'll probably be using the same tools. I'll say, can can I ask Ian and uh, and Kate? I'm wondering if voters are are looking at it any differently than than Mike says that CEOs are uh, to say, you know, this this is not a city we want to live in, where people can't find housing uh, both both easily and and we've got to and we've got to see it and and what's what's your sense and what what do you think voters want from this and following uh on something that alan, alan was saying there will this may all race be a a referendum on different approaches to homelessness uh or or what are voters looking for when when they want a solution to this uh, ask ian first and then kate sure uh thanks ernest um I think everybody wants a solution to the issue. I think that there are a group of people who don't want to see people experiencing homelessness. I think there's a group of people who don't want to have people experiencing homelessness. And I actually think those are two different groups of people sometimes. 
Um, and often like people get worried. I was listening to one of the candidates on CityCast talking about um, how they took their kids downtown and they were holding their hand a little tighter and dad did it just to see a drug deal go down, that kind of thing. Like, I think we can all agree that like, we don't want kids experiencing some of the, you know, uh, more unfortunate elements of the tragedy we've got down there right now. But, I, you know, I, I do think that Denver voters are smart and sophisticated. Like I said, they're progressive, like I said. So I don't think that sort of like the you know, lock them up and throw away the key or crack down type of approaches are really going to resonate in this race. I think people want a compassionate solution. I think people want housing. I think people want housing for everybody. They want housing for people who are priced out of the Denver area and Denver metro area who are just normal workers who want to live in our wonderful community. And then on the other side, there are people who, you know, I, I don't know. It's a complicated issue because I think we actually know a lot about what works, but I think Alan's got a good point that the same thing's not gonna work for everybody. But I do think that if you're able to do some of the, what the social impact bond, for instance, that the Urban Institute ran and studied in Denver in cooperation with the city showed is that it is not only more humane and more effective to put somebody in housing that has treatment wraparound services and all these other things built into it, it's also less expensive at the end of the day than letting people cycle in and out of jails, letting people cycle in and out of Denver Health, let them uh, having them come in contact with law enforcement or other first responders all the time. My brother-in-law is a firefighter in the city, and every anytime there's an incident, you've got a full fire truck, full of firefighters, and an ambulance full of paramedics that show up to the scene. That happens so much in Denver; it is it is costing a ton of money. Star program is a good start. Um, the social impact bond study is a good start, but I think you take you should take a look at some of these things that are working. And like Alan said, the next mayor is going to have a set of tools. Figure out which ones are working for the most people at the lowest cost with the best outcomes, and try and maximize those as much as you can. Yeah, but one thing that also I love that Alan said though is that there has to be you know I think what we're trying to figure out with these candidates, I think Denver voters are trying to figure out is what where's the boundary, where's the law um, that can trigger some of these next steps. And, you know, and I think that the one thing we do know about Denver voters in recent history is that in 2019, there was initiative 300 and 81% of voters um, rejected, you know, that initiative. And so I do think that, you know, when I, I agree with Ian that, you know, you know, Denver voters do seem to want, you know, compassionate, thoughtful approaches to this issue because it is so difficult. But what I am feeling to hear from some of the candidates is, you know, what is going to be that boundary and that trigger? Um, and what, you know, what is the law going to look like when it comes to, um, you know, taking the next step? Um, and so, you know, you hear some candidates say that they would not enforce the camping ban. You hear some say that they would. And that's a pretty important distinction when you start talking about the turning point um, in the discussion and which doors open afterwards. So that that is one kind of concrete thing that I think we know about Denver voters in recent history. It will be really interesting to see what they are looking for in their mayoral candidate, because that is a pretty defining line with some of these candidates. Hey, Lynn, I'm glad you mentioned the camping ban, because I think there's been a lot of uh, um, debate about it and a lot of debate about sweeps versus cleanups. And, and I, I frankly think this debate isn't very helpful to get at the fundamental problem that I just described, which is how do you intervene with people on the street effectively? What resources do you need? And how can state law be, cha be changed to maybe help that along a little bit instead of being an impediment? The data on the camping ban is interesting. Uh, it's been in effect since 2014. Um, and the city attorney will tell you that it's used almost every day as, as, as a tool to encourage people to get out of an encampment and into services. So it's used as a as a as a as a measure to try and encourage that, uh, only four people since 2014 have been uh, arrested and actually taken into custody as a result of the camping ordinance. And I think at uh, the 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 maybe 40 plus number, it's not much. It's well below 50 since 2014 uh, have received cit citations. 
So I think it's an interesting debate. People can say, put it away because you don't use it very often. Other people will say, no, it's a tool in the toolbox. That's the mayor's view, the current mayor's view. But to me, the debate kind of misses the point. How do you, again, intervene with people on the street when they can't accept services, won't accept resources, uh, don't feel trusting about resources, and because it's a serious addiction, the proliferation of fentanyl on the streets? Denver can't solve that on its own. We do need resources from the state, and we need probably some changes in the law to, to help us uh, navigate this through, not to throw people in jail because of their addictions. That's not the point. The point is, again, to have law enforcement and public health working in a, co a collaborative way. And I would, I think the candidates ought to be talking about it in this way. It's very hard to do because you can get yourself into trouble like I probably just did. But yeah. I think I think that's uh, where the debate could really be helpful for Denver voters to understand um, what the tools really are and what are the what are the challenges to getting people service. Okay, oh, okay. that's interesting. I'll, I'll do a, a quick candidates. reminder. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, just sorry, Ernest, just right. briefly. Uh, it, it is interesting. There's a great there's a great clue as to what is important to Denver voters, and it's on it's on all of these candidates' websites. I mentioned six candidates earlier. And they all have homelessness and, and a, a set of policy solutions uh, sort of front and center. And, um, you know, if I could just uh, project into the future for just a minute, my read, just for what it's worth from watching this, is that I think I think there's a lot more public consensus about the right thing um, broadly, maybe not super well articulated. Um, I think I think Kate's right that people do want to see um the the ban in force but i also it, but it doesn't mean they don't want to be compassionate i i actually think there's an incredible amount of compassion i met with uh, mike kaufman mayor of aurora a while ago he shockingly went undercover uh, as a homeless person for a week in the middle of winter about two years ago and um he noted that he gained weight he gained weight while he was homeless he didn't have money it's it's because of the generosity and outpouring of people uh that will bring food to the camps that to me it's just a marker that people really want to be compassionate but they also they also just want to to bring uh, bring about a better way of <clears throat> life <clears throat> excuse me uh, for those people and for the health of the city mm -hmm. uh could quick reminder that that uh, initiative uh 300 that went down overwhelmingly four years ago uh that that would have banned the camping ban and and that's banned enforcement of the camping ban and that that's become a uh a major major issue in the campaign at this point to uh shift in in our time remaining to other and maybe an adjacent issue is public safety uh some of the candidates are saying we need to we need to hire a whole lot more cops uh probably easier said than done in in this employment market these days um uh, what what do you all think about that and and how do these uh how do these candidates differentiate themselves and motivate their voters to the polls based on that can can we start with Ian? sure yeah thanks ernest um i think you know building on the success of some of the innovative programs like star is going to be really critical to going forward here um it's it's a groundbreaking program that cities all over the country are copying and adopting for good reasons uh, oftentimes, uh, sending someone with a stick and a gun to a situation doesn't solve the problem and often can make it worse. Uh, sending a mental health counselor, a social worker, or somebody with a clipboard uh, and a list of resources is a lot more effective. Um, so I think we need to continue to expand on that for sure. Um, you need to get the police force to a level of like parity with the population. It seems like we're understaffed right now. Um, but I also think that means you need more training, more accountability, and, and better police officers in general. So I think these two things can and should happen at the same time. There have been lots of reforms taking place in the state level and the local level to try and speed that along. Um, but I think you also just need resources too, right? Like the, the police budget in Denver is relatively large, I think. It, 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 the budget is right sized, I guess, is what you could say for the population. The question is, what kind of folks do you have in the department and what are their jobs and what are they doing? So I do think that you can expand on STAR. You can have lots of uh, more, you know, contact with professionals and assistance and support services than you do with law enforcement agents with sticks and guns. And I think that better training and accountability can be part of all of that to sort of like increase public safety, lower the temperature at the same time, and rebuild that trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. 
Um, lots of candidates are talking about the sort of like beat cop neighborhood police officer who walks the block and gets to know people. I think there's a lot of value in that so that people feel like they're being protected and not policed or over policed. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that there's got to be some real work done in the community to bridge that gap again. I mean, this is an issue, you know, that that phrase rebuilding the trust between law enforcement and the community is something that Angela Williams said back in 2011. I mean, we've been having this conversation in Colorado for a really, really long time, and we have not yet solved that issue. So while I think that like capacity is definitely part of it, a approach needs to be taken into consideration as well. We should build on what's working and not keep doing what's not working. Sure. Yeah, the one thing I want to hear from candidates is, you know, how specifically are they going to tackle the recruitment and retention problem? Yeah. Because I I agree with several things that Ian said. I personally agree that there should be more law enforcement in Denver and we should continue to expand. But I am increasingly worried as a voter about the recruitment and retention problem because none of the other things can happen until we, you know, recruit more officers and then, you know, incentivize them to stay here um, in this in the police force. So that's the thing that I think is missing from the debate debate are the specifics around yet yeah, the numbers are great to talk about and the types of work they would be doing is great to talk about, but how will you recruit them and retain them? We're about we're down about 150 officers, and this is something that the administration has not ignored. You have to hiring a, a police officer is not like going to Walmart and picking off a police officer off the, you know, off the oh, here's 10 more police officers will go by them. You have to budget. You have to put a recruitment class together. Uh, to Ian's point, training. Denver has one of the most intensive training programs of any police force in the country. Um, and also one of the most reform-minded police uh, departments in the country. Um, so you have to, there's a timeline for officers. And then you also have the civil service system, which can sometimes get in the way of uh, checking the box on a new recruit to put them into, into uh, a force. You have to pay them well. Uh, not many people may know this, but we have unions that we negotiate with, with police officers that are represented by a union. So you have to have a collective bargaining agreement. It was difficult, I will tell you, to convince city council to give the cops a raise back in 2020, it was, I think now 2021. Um, and the good issues were raised. But I think the notion, and it's easy for candidates to say, well, we just need 140 more cops, or I'm going to put 200 cops on the street, and they're going to be the best trained people ever. Yeah, amen. We all agree. Uh, but the process for doing that is complicated, and I also think we ought to be realistic about what that process is, and to have a, a, a relationship with the, with law enforcement that's, that is uh, uh, conducive to uh, better outcomes on the street. And that means we elevate the role of a police officer and honor their work, which I think we try and do every day. Um, I want to get to Mike just really quickly, and then we'll shift to some of the audience questions. Um, there's there's a ton of them, but Mike, you know, I'm hearing homelessness. I'm hearing uh, cops, retention, recruitment. I'm hearing public safety and crime and how we deal with these issues. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, M Mike is going to be thinking, how is this going to affect our businesses? It, because homelessness the way Alan and Ian and Kate and Ernest explain it, it's going to take a lot of resources and you do need the money to do that. Talk about uh, expanding the law enforcement um, a pool that we have, that that's money as well. You talked about all these other um, uh, policies that the city is thinking, you know, they either would add uh, uh, fees or taxes or they would extract more from businesses and residents in order to fund them. So I, how are you, you know, uh, absorbing all of these? Well, thank you. I, well, listen, I've, I, Denver uh, typically does not have a problem uh, creating more revenues. Uh, the voters almost invariably say yes. They probably have a lot of uh, un, un, uh, expended, uh, though authorized spending, uh, authorized uh money to to spend on more police it would be my would be my guess alan would know better i don't know if that's correct it probably is correct uh, but in any event i i think that it's really key that the next mayor just leads the city and steps back away from the noise the just sort of the 
the you know the anti and the negativity. Um, let's let's value these police. Let's get them into the community. Uh, let's bring the reforms that we need uh, to policing. Uh, I think Ian made a really key point, and you know people. People on foot interacting with their police on foot interacting with their community. There's there's been research that's shown that they they it, it kind of humanizes the community for the police officer and make and forms a connection. I'm not a policing expert. I don't know if that's right, but I know that humans typically regard other humans they know and and recognize uh, in a little different way. And um, I guess just the broad point I I'd like to make on all of this is. Uh, it'd be wonderful to have a mayor that would lead the city on this and step out of the categories that we have right now and and just create um, you know a, a vision for bringing the community together to be safe. Let's get the police, let's show them that we value them and let's bring the reforms forward that that we need in policing, whatever those may be. Uh, let's go to some of the questions from our from our viewers and our listeners here. Um, you know, uh, the streets team assisted response program star uh we have you know mental health experts um uh, the idea there is that uh we approach policing uh or or some of these problems in a in a in a different way than we've had in the past uh one viewer asked why is it why are those services only being serviced in a part of the city rather than the whole city is that is that true alan and if yes uh, well, I think the, the 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 star program is for the entire city. We have uh, hotspot policing, which is a new reform measure that tries to connect police to nonprofits and neighborhood uh, entities. We have five hotspot entities in Denver. That may be what the person is referring to, but star is available throughout the city. And uh, to Ian's point, um, yeah, a very successful program uh, that we should uh, tribute to uh, uh, former uh, police chief Paul Pazin. Uh, who came up with that idea with some other folks. Uh, we just opened the AIDS Center. Didn't get much press around it, unfortunately, but the AIDS Center is also a walk-in location for people in crisis who can uh, get uh, uh, treatment and, 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 and uh, assistance in their lives so they don't end up in jail. It's, it's kind of a pre-jail kind of situation for people. We want to intervene earlier. So getting more AIDS Centers around the city might be something that uh, could be in the next mayor's budget. Uh, here's another question. What has Denver fought against community land trusts? Um, and, and, and forgive me, I don't know what community land trusts are or is, um, but does anyone want to take up this question? Fought against them? What has Denver fought against? I think we've been engaged in land trust projects. They're complicated. Uh, financing mm -hmm. can be an issue, but I need more detail on what we're allegedly fighting against because I don't think that's accurate. Ernest, do you have a question in mind from the audience? Uh, I, I'm seeing a couple here. Uh, one, one that's interesting. I'm not sure we can answer in a couple of minutes, but uh, is there some reason that we can't take advantage of the 20,000 supposedly vacant luxury apartments to house people who, uh, who either are unable to afford housing or who are experiencing homelessness? Looking at the city's vacancy issues and homelessness, put them together. Why why can't we do that? Well, I, in some ways, Ernest, let me take a shot at it, um, and then I'll let everybody weigh in. Um, if you look at the challenge of homelessness and affordable housing as an aspect of it, then clearly space and location, um, uh, real estate is is the place to go. But if you're talking about people in crisis on the street, putting putting them in a building is is only part of the solution the, the really costly part is staffing and as we found with the migrants that came up from uh the the border um who want to work um the shelter part the, the finding the building was maybe the easiest part the hard part was the staffing and the resources that go with it so you just don't throw somebody in a building i think the the better approach for um downtown buildings in particular and we're piloting this now in denver is adaptive reuse where you take office space since people are not necessarily going to be working in offices in the same way they did pre pandemic and retrofitting those buildings to create more um, housing opportunities, affordable housing opportunities. It's expensive to retrofit those buildings. In the case of uh, luxury apartments that are owned by people, you it's private property, the city can't just condemn that. So it's, uh, it's costly, but I think there's a kernel of uh, opportunity there since Denver can't annex 
we have to operate within the boundaries we have to use those spaces. But and then as, some some of the but, other innovative stuff is like the hotel motel bill that the legislature passed. The city's been doing a ton of taking some of these condemned hotels and motels and and remodeling them and reopening them as service centers. I think that's a great model. I love adaptive reuse. It's a really interesting idea. You have this weird flight from offices from the pandemic. At the same time, you have em literal empty space. Some of those buildings are actually easy to retrofit. Some of them are incredibly difficult. So figuring out which ones are sort of most cost effective, closest by the sort of hot spots that Alan was talking about where people are looking for services makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the good news, I think, in this whole conversation is that the city's got a lot of challenges right now, but like Denver's always had booms and busts and good times and bad times and good years and bad years and high crime and low crime. Like it, it, people pretend like this is a brand new issue. It's not. I mean, we're in a cycle right now and we just went through a global pandemic that exacerbated everything. But the next mayor is going to have a lot of opportunity for innovation and a lot of opportunity to try things. And a lot of opportunity, I think, to interact with the community and, and experiment and pilot things and see what works and build off some of the successful stuff that's been happening and also figure out a new, a new way forward. So I'm actually quite excited about this. It's a big uh, choice for a city I don't live in, by the way. I'm in Lakewood. Uh, to make, but um, I'm really excited about the campaign and, and and the fact that we have 17 candidates who all are bringing really interesting and unique ideas to the conversation. Um, this is this is one for the books, and and I think it, the other thing that comes out of this conversation is I don't think a single one of us know how this thing is going to end, even though we're really close to voting. Um, and uh, we're we're pretty much out of time, but I want to give give uh, Caitlin, Alan, and Mike just a chance to tell me, you know. A month, uh, a month ago, before the mayor's, uh, you know, before we elect a new mayor, what in this process, what for you has, is the silver lining, if there is such one, uh, Caitlin? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I will say too, we've talked a lot about issues. This is also a very big job. I mean, Alan, you're correct me, but you know, the city of Denver has what, like twelve thousand employees, and it's you know, this is this also is, um, I think. Ian's right. This is a big opportunity, but also a really big job. So, you know, what when I think about um, you know, kind of this race this far out, I think one of the silver linings is we do have a lot of experienced candidates um stepping up to, you know, that have, you know, the wherewithal, both from a policy and just a leadership perspective to to handle this role. You know, that's something I would really look for. Um, in a candidate is, you know, this, the issues are one thing and you have to align with the candidates on the way they will approach them. But also this is a big job with lots of people and, you know, it's multifaceted. So like, can, can you also just handle the sheer logistic scale of what it takes to run a city like this? And I think one of the silver linings is watching so many, you know, there's several candidates that I do think, um, could, could handle that scope. So that's always really encouraging to see. Um, you know, people that are willing to kind of upend their lives and what they're currently doing and, you know, put their their uh, hat in the ring. I, I like that. Mike? Well, that's really well said. Unfortunately, uh, Kate took a good chunk of uh, my commentary, but I would say one thing that is heartening to me truly is it's when you're running for office, you'd rather talk about pleasant things for sure. You'd rather, you'd, you know, You'd rather talk about unicorns and passing out muffins and things like that than than really difficult things for a number of reasons um, uh, you know, that are fairly obvious, I think. And I'm I'm particularly happy that everybody is talking about the homelessness issue. Um, I think it's um, I, I think it's time as a society we we figure out how to how to get through this moment uh, and do much better by our fellow man and woman and. Um, you know, and bring healing to them, um, and and bring safety to the streets. Uh, I hate to sound like I'm I'm trying to channel a a TV preacher, but I, I'm I'm encouraged by that. It's not pleasant to be on the campaign trail talking about very very difficult hard things with with frankly no super clear pathway to success. Um, and so I think hopefully the community will rally around the mayor, uh, and they'll adopt something cogent and really have a mandate to work that out. Uh, Alan? Well, I want to thank thank you for inviting me to this and uh, hopefully didn't get myself into trouble. I have, uh, uh, Jesse raised an issue that I think is an important one on this challenge of service providers. Do we need to pay them better? The answer, Jesse, is yes. 
we need to elevate that kind of work and make a professional career out of it and not treat it like it's a a um, uh, not, not at the centerpiece of the city. I would say, I don't know everybody who's running, but I'd say the top five or six are people that I've had the honor to work with and know and consider friends. So I look forward, this has been the honor of my life to work the last six years in local government for Mayor Hancock. It's the best thing professionally that I have done and will probably ever do. And um, uh, the goal is to turn over the keys to to one of these people, and and maybe it's one that I know and love and and have affection for. Uh, in any event, we want to turn over the city in the best possible shape, and look forward to that transition. I do think Denver's um, a good a good city to live in, a great city, and um, we're not uh, we're not going to be down. We're going forward. And Ian, just really quickly, sir. I. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the time. I look forward to seeing how things shakes out. And I'm just pleased that uh, there are 17 horses in this race and I don't have one. Um, <laughs> so good luck to the people of Denver in making your very important and difficult choice. Um, but luckily, I think they'll make the right one. Uh, Ian, Alan, uh, Kate, Mike, and Ernest, uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. And Vince in the background, thank you, sir, for helping us. Uh, get this uh this program great conversation everybody i'm i'm hoping that we'll get another one uh i'm assuming that we're gonna have a runoff right that's the assumption here we're gonna have a runoff and and so we'll uh, we'll do this again and to our viewers and listeners thank you for your time appreciate it and enjoy the rest of your day thanks guys thanks, thanks, thanks everybody thanks all